on our way to this uh, secret nuclear bunker. It is top secret, only a few people know where the location is. Suddenly we heard a voice out in the graveyard. Carol, and this is your lovely pub, and you're just around the corner from the uh, nuclear uh, bunker that I'm going to spend the night in. Would you do that at all, Carol? No. There is a woman here. Can you call out for us, please? You know, they, they have the invisible friend. Because already I'm getting my hair stood on there. So if you just follow me, I think it's up this way, isn't it, Andy? Um, yeah, I, I, I've got a feeling it is. It's just this way, somewhere up here. It's a secret nuclear bunker, so um, completely secret. Um, nobody knows where it is. Rich, <laughs> yeah. um, I, can you tell me the way to the top secret nuclear bunker that's not <laughs> that's not written on the <laughs> on the on the signpost? <laughs> I think it. I think it's so broad, isn't it? It's so obvious to anyone uh, when they go there. They can just see that sign which uh, made me laugh, um, you know, when I saw it, actually. What does that hark back to the Cold War, does it? Yeah, what it was, was um, they were expecting, that, you know, in the Cold War, if anything happened and, uh, you know, the Prime Minister or, or anyone had to go underground, it was going to be Kelvin Hatch. And actually, when you go down in the hatch, you can actually see um, the uh, Prime Minister's room and all the various people, all the politicians, where they would have been. Um, and it was quite funny because there's loads of mannequins around there. So um, I think they had a, I think they had a John Major or a Margaret Thatcher mannequin. They didn't have a Boris one there at the time. <laughs> yes, I think there'd be a lot of people listening. Wish he'd go down there and we could lock the do lock the door. <laughs> yeah, I can well believe that. It would be good. <laughs> Mate, it's absolutely incredible to have you on board the T-shirt. Fantastic. Um, the whole reason I started this show is just to chat to interesting people about fascinating areas of life. Some Sometimes I know a lot about it and we, we, we have a good old banter. Other times I'm sat here gobsmacked because <laughs> it's an area I've never really sort of um, covered myself. And ghosts and the like, um, I think it's okay to say that Obviously, I have a healthy degree of scepticism. Um, not to put my guests down, folks, not not at all. But I think Rich probably does does himself. I, I'm exactly the same, actually. The funny thing is, Chris, I, I am I'm the biggest skeptic there is, and um, I started it because there's a lot of programs, and I've met the most haunted team. I've met. Carl Beatty of that field in, and that is for television, I will say. Um, I've met all of those people, and um, they once approached me to do a TV show, and they said, um, can we get you to a knock here and not there? You know, all the kind of false things that happen on television. And I said, no, I'm not into that. I said, I want it to be real. And I said, and, and, and I actually believe that a lot of things can be explained by psychology and by science. So um, that's why they call me the ghost challenger, because I say to somebody, Leave me alone in a building, I'll challenge it. But I don't necessarily believe that we're going to, you know, that, that, that I'm going to actually see anything. Mm. And and you're a mental health advocate, so we'll come on to that because that's a yeah. very very yeah. valuable area to cover for all of us um, in in this modern hectic um, life and times. But what what is a ghost? <laughs> I sound really stupid, don't I? What is a ghost? But what what is a ghost? Well. A lot of people um, ask that question. I mean, what actually, how do you define a ghost? And the truth of the matter is nobody actually knows what a ghost is. And when you see these people on television or you even see them on YouTube with all their gadgets and saying, I can detect a ghost. I mean, the funny thing and crazy thing about that is they don't really know what one is. So how they can detect one is um, beyond me. Um, but obviously a ghost is meant to be... Um, the spirit of somebody that once lived and once walked amongst us, they believe that there is an afterlife. Uh, many people believe that um, they can just um, appear and it's their spirit that's appearing to us. Other people believe it's uh, like a recording in time, that something happens major in a house, um, say a murder was committed or something horrendous like that, and it almost records the, 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 the building records the event. And when you go back there, you're not actually seeing 
the ghost that can you can interact with. You're actually seeing a, a recording of it. And sometimes people are there at that precise moment and other times they're not. Um, I'll give you a quick example. We've got a near Bristol, um, there's a place called Chew Valley Lake. And um, there's a story about the girl that walks around the lake of Chew Valley. Um, there's a lot of exaggeration because they say that when the lake was filled in, they she drowned in the lake, which isn't true. Chew Valley was put there, ran about the uh, the lake was there in the 1950s and it was just for the water board. So I can't imagine anyone was drowned in the in the lake. But there certainly is a story of a girl that walks around and I've interviewed many credible witnesses. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying they're credible. They're, some of them are police officers. I'm a former police officer. I'm not saying they're always credible, but I met a couple of police officers and they said that they were patrolling at the time and they said all I can say is I saw it like a hologram saw this girl she was wet dripping wet and walking up the road and um, they they saw it so um, one can only take their account on things and think well they must have been awake at the time because they were patrolling and um, they couldn't have been hallucinating Um, but um, other people have said but it's only on a specific date you see her and that's when back in time she apparently drowned so um, it's like a recording I feel a bit like, um, do you remember Ali, Ali G? Yeah. I want to say, so Rich, do ghosts actually begin with G? <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredible. I, I met Ali G once. I'll never forget that. He's great. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, tell never, us about not- that. Not ghost hunting. Um, it was my day's um, nightclub in, and he was at a nightclub in uh, Bristol, and, that, and um, he was, um, you know, doing his, um, uh, his, his, I forget the name of it, the one he does, the main impression. But um, it was great, you know. He's 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 a laugh a minute. He really, it'd be, it'd be fantastic to take him out actually, just for the comedy value. <laughs> Yes, um, comedy gold, and it goes so quick. I mean, there's probably our young friends out there listening to this, and I don't really know who Ali Ali G is, and yet, yeah, it's one of those. Um, I don't know if you call it a bastions of British comedy over the years that have shaped all of us. Certainly, shape when I'm when I'm writing my books, I'm I'm drawing upon Monty Python and um, yeah, Rick Mail, and you know, just this kind of way of being funny which is not necessarily just telling a <laughs> telling a joke um but the the well I, I actually was on a comedy podcast about ghosts because um uh we were actually having a joke about ghosts and everything else and they said um well will you come on it they said um you're you're very serious about it i said no I, I'll, I'll come on and have a have a good laugh about it you know and and joke about it because i believe everything i believe every subject I mean, we're we'll going to mental health later, but I do believe that every subject you you can laugh at and have fun with sometimes, as long as it's done in a in a in a good way, you know. Yes, exactly. And um, there's lots of things in life that people believe in, and it. I think it comes down to that expression. There's now as weird as folk. Yeah. Um, very much so, very much. When you hear the stories that people tell and the people you meet, um, I mean, I've travelled all around the world visiting different cultures and seeing what they believe, and it really does come home that saying that there's nothing weird as folk. Um, you know, it, it, and it makes life interesting. It's the, the tapestry of life, as they say. Do you think it becomes a bit cult-like for people? Or, or that- it does. There, there are, I mean, I have come across that. Um, I, I actually did a an event um, and I went out and I said, I wanted to um, probably get a group of people together, maybe to do, um, do events because I didn't go into that in the end, but I went out and I ended up meeting a coven of uh, witches and all sorts of people that were, were deeply involved in it and believing in it. And um, that kind of uh, makes you realize that there, there, there can be that element to it, which uh, I'm certainly not involved in, but um you know, you can get that. And the difficulty with the subject is because you're talking about life after death and, you know, there's there's the there's the beliefs in it, so you've got to be respectful of that. But again, there is the kind of uh, 
cult element of it. I mean, I know you talk a lot about um, Illuminati and and all the conspiracy theories, and I love those things as well, you know, um, and that's something that I read a lot about because some of the places I go, I mean, there's a place that I go is very haunted, and it actually... um, one of the people that were there were actually part of the uh, Freemasons. And um, there was all sorts that went on. There's Hell's Cave as well, where all sorts went on, where the rich and famous, um, you know, they, they had uh, prostitutes in the tunnels, all horrendous things that, that went on. And you, you think, well, there's something in all this, you know, what's going on, you know? Yes, exactly. And um, if I can just tell a little anecdote, I, I worked in Mozambique for six months teaching street children. And we got to travel around Mozambique quite a lot. And one of the places we went to was this sort of um, highly religious mountain. And there were Mm. caves in the bottom of it and this sort of stuff. So we rocked up there as um, what was our official role. We were development instructors. Yeah. (laughs) Very grandiose title as if, as if, you know, Africans can't look after themselves. Um, but we went to this mountain and we the, the local witch doctor came out to meet us. And then we proceeded through all these um, religious sites. And all of them were, uh, let's just say, open to extreme interpretation. The, the first one, for example, we, we, we stopped by a, a sort of stagnant pool. And the witch doctor reached in his pocket and brought out some grains of rice and he just yeah. sprink- sprinkled them on the pool. And then in about 30 seconds, all these bubbles started to go, what up, what up. And you, you know, if, if you, if you literally knew no better, you'd think, Oh my, what? Yeah. Someone, yeah. Someone's trying to communicate with us. And the next one would be, I don't know. It'd be like a drip. Yeah. coming down off the rocks that they that they would pray to as if this is some medium to the other the other side and I, I just say this friends for the sake of interest is you can get a very modernized sub-saharan african person or in my case mozambican they're working for an ngo uh, or a charity they they dress in western ways they talk the talk they jump on a i don't know honda motorbike to go home um they're 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 on the program with you so they're talking about you know we we incorporate or trying to incorporate science so we're talking about like aids and hiv and this kind this kind of stuff anyway um and of course the other thing is religion so they're practicing christians when we got in that cave you just saw a change come over them where their yeah. real true self came out. And suddenly this, this woman who was one of our workers, she's stripping her top off and she's b- trying to get under these drips. Yeah. So yeah. all the Christianity, that's all just, <laughs> uh, uh, and this, this is what I found as well. When I went, uh, went up to these countries is that the, the missionaries bought Christianity and, and all the various religions we know from the West, to these places and um you know like you say once you strip away that and they and they can be honest to themselves then then so often you find that they uh go back to their traditional beliefs i'm probably having a bit of a paranormal moment with my um screen here can you bear with me once i just adjust something yeah well um, you do that i'll tell you an, another anecdote and that was one of the chaps that worked with us was from denmark who's a um, mozambican by birth He'd been adopted, let's just say, at the age of two or something by um, Denmarkians, or a.k.a. Danish, a Danish couple. And so from like two or three years old, he'd grown up a, a, in the, let's just call it the Western world. And we all rocked up over there in Mozambique, and he's one of us, you know. He's perfect English, fluent Danish, obviously. Um, and... Gradually, over the course of that six months, you saw a change in him. Yeah. And the next thing you know, he's hanging around with all the sort of gangster types, um, robbing and stealing stuff. And 
And he developed a, a, a rash on his face that got really sort of infected. It was, and I remember him saying to me, look him in the eye and saying, Chris, do you think I should go to the witch doctor? Someone's put a curse on me. I'm like, mate, no, you've just got a bad infection. It, it, it's the tropics. We come from Europe. It, it's, you know, or Scandinavia. It, it, it's to be expected. And nah, you, you couldn't talk him out of it. He, you know, he, he genuinely believed that someone had put a curse on him. And this is someone that had grown up from two years old in, you know, in, in, in Denmark. It's just I, incredible. I think, I think that's the problem with this voodoo and, and, and the kind of things that go on in the hoodoo and all the different uh, beliefs that go on in these countries that the, the belief system, you know, if you, I mean, if you go back in time, I mean, I, I do a lot of history on witchcraft and a lot of the women were just persecuted because they'd go around to a house, knock on a door and, and beg for money. And if somebody would give money, they'd say, well, I put a curse on you. And that was so strong, the belief of people in those days that they believed it so much, they literally have a heart attack. And I think that is that the, the belief in it can be the dangerous part. Although, there, there are things I've seen which even I kind of think, well, you know, what's going on here? And, um, you know, uh, I tend to stick more with ghosts and uh, people seeing ghosts and their beliefs in ghosts. But, um, you know, there are occasions when you think, oh, wow, that's uh, that's a bit, um, a bit weird, a bit strange, you know? Yeah, and we're very um, judgmental, aren't we, in, 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 mm. in, in, well, in my case in England? because we, we look at this and we call it all voodoo nonsense, blah, blah, blah. But I remember once walking down a pavement and there was a ladder on the pavement. And I thought, ah, stupid superstition. Yeah. Don't don't walk under. Well, I walked under that ladder and that afternoon it cost me <laughs> three and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> I'm not prepared to say on a podcast what, what happened to me, but I got into some trouble and... And uh, yeah, it cost it cost me. And Rich, ever since, I I can't walk under a ladder, and and I'm mm. I'm the most rational. <laughs> yeah. I, um, and I'm trying to wean myself off at the moment, saying, "Morning, Mister Magpie." <laughs> just, <laughs> we got a load of them round here, and I'm just a bit OCD that if I don't say it, something bad might happen to me. I think once it's been, once something's happened like that, Chris, when you've walked on a ladder and something has happened, I think it's understandable that then you're going to get a little bit, well, hang on a minute, you know, uh, I took a chance here, walked under that ladder and this happened. And um, you think, well, maybe I better uh, be cautious of all these kind of um, beliefs and sayings. Friends at home, put it in the comments. Should I have walked under that ladder? Okay, what do you think? You think it's nonsense? You think there's something in it? Do you think it's a mental um, deficient? You know, something's not 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 right in your thinking. Let us know what what you think. I'll be fascinated to, to, to hear. Um, yes, there's only one rule: is in your comments, as I always say to my son, you're not allowed to refer to me as a boldy slaphead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, this is this is. Um, Fascinating. So we've got a situation where there's now Sequira's folk. We we have we have deep emotion drawn into it because it's surrounding death. We don't yeah. really understand death in um in the in the Western world. We we think that we lose people and I'm always saying you can't lose anyone with carbon molecules. Mm. We just change form. We're beautiful, yeah, we, you yeah. know. It's we just change into something beautiful, which um, which which is what um, was meant by um, I think it was um, Einstein when he said about you know that we go on. He didn't actually mean that we go on as ghosts or anything, but we, we come back as another form. And I think that's a nice thing to think. And I always think that that even if there isn't an afterlife and and all the kind of fanciful things that people like to think about, you know, the fact is I know that one day at least I'll be in the same state as my parents or people that have, you know, gone by. And, um, yeah, I, it, I think we do shy away from it in, in the Western world. Um, we do tend to not speak about it. Um, and, and that's very, very common amongst the Western world. Yes. You've got to embrace death as part of the beautiful circle of life. It's that simple. Your mate or your mother or your loved one, they've, you know, they're still here, folks. They've just changed, you know, 
part of the universe we can't get out we, we these molecules have been here from eternity or from the beginning and they'll be here till eternity and when when you embrace that way of thinking then you it takes so much upset and misery out of your life of course you're going to be upset when someone dies you know of course but i mean sorry i'm talking a, a lot mate that's when i talk a lot it's because i'm fascinated that's okay yeah it means i've got a great great guess but uh the other day i was doing some concreting with my son and we're out there building a, a bike shed and a leaf blew by as we were doing it we had our trowels out and he looked at me and he went oh daddy there goes granddad you know yeah how beautiful what beautiful yeah. way that the lad's set up for life now of not going in the doom and gloom and the wearing the black and the my my son did the same um he saw he saw something and said that that's granny that's granny um saying hello and i thought well, you know it's it's wonderful when they give that child gives that kind of innocent thing and, and like you say doesn't look at it in the doom and gloom and has that kind of belief and i think the thing is I'm very, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a skeptic and I go into this, but I'm also very conscious that beliefs are very sacred to people. So, um, you know, it's like um, a child's belief in father for Santa Claus. And if children are listening, there is a Santa Claus. But, um, you know, it's like children's belief in fairies and all that going well, back it, into the past. If someone said we, there's not. No, I don't, I don't think they have. No, no, oh. just if they <laughs> But um, with, with ghosts, I mean, I think people need to believe in something they need to be, they need to know and if if often when people see around and say i'm a skeptic i can explain it like this i mean you probably know of um you've probably heard of richard dawkins when he's done the um uh, the god illusion you know the the, the one of the fantastic book because i was brought up in i was indoctrinated by religion so i do understand where he's coming from mm. but um you know when someone comes out with a scientific thing and said no that's it you know, it's all over. There's no belief. I think people are fearful of that. They need to have something, you know, they need to have something that they can believe in. Oh, exactly. Before I came on the show today, I've been sitting on the bed with my notepad and I've got a wonderful book. It's actually a two part book and it's called the, um, Oh, can't remember its exact name, but it's like the dictionary of the ancient scriptures. And it tells you, what the words in in for example the bible what they really mean like yeah. how they're not meant to be taken literally so for example um bread it's, you know when you go to church your vicar's there telling you that jesus like broke this bread and, and it's all literal yeah and and you look you literally lose the whole message there what what is saying is bread is um it's like spirit information from heaven. So it's it's like the source, creator, yeah. universe, God, whatever you want to call it. It's that it, it's it's talking to you. I eat bread information mm. from he, um, from heaven. Um, it, it, fascinating. Like the term Israelites doesn't mean what we think it is. It's not a people. It's a state. You know, these are all states of of um, development. Probably. You'd probably like the book by P. Manley. He was actually a Freemason, and he's gone back in the 1920s. Um, but he actually did a lot about the ancient beliefs and, and all that, about the, um, you know, going back to the Egyptians and going back and all the different um, forms of Freemasonry and stuff like that. And all that's fascinating as well. Yes, exactly. Um, just going to get him up on the screen here so people can see. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, hang on. One he's quite a, if you see a photo of him he does look quite a frightening character when you see um see him when he was young yes the, the, he does look a bit like he could be playing a a vampire in a in a <laughs> in a film or something yeah was he i think he was an honorary 33 yeah um degree mason wasn't he um but this is where it gets fascinating because when we when I look at stuff, Rich, I don't look at it like in the minutiae because you can't make sense of stuff. If you get stuck in the weeds arguing about the if, if the world's flat, you, you, you miss so much. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> with the whole, uh, let's just say like the moon landings thing, I'm not, I don't care if like the flag is fluttering. That's not where it's at. You're not, 
what I'm interested in is that NASA, um, the National Socialist scientists or the German scientists in the war were desperate to try to put a rocket into orbit, obviously, yeah, as, all, yeah. as many scientists are. At the same time, in, in um, California, you had these young American kids and they were desperate to get a rocket into into this you know, magical thing called, called space. And at the same time, they all come to the conclusion, like, we ain't going to do this. Not You, you yeah. can't put fossil fuel in a tin can and get it out of orbit. You, 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 it, 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 so they went to the dark side. They started to look at the esoteric side. Is this something, you know, can we glean something yeah. through hidden knowledge? And then, of course, Operation Paperclip was where they brought the um, the Germans over to America and gave them amnesty from from war crimes to work on the rocket program, which then became obviously NASA. So these two groups of esoteric yeah. esotericists, you know, these these occult yeah. occult believers came together, and that's NASA. So that's your basis for starting to understand the space program, not like you know. Me yeah. cubic meters of fuel and and gravity and no it's to, it's to understand that it it really you know the rockets have got the checkerboard on haven't they the masonic um masonic yeah the symbol the the checkerboard um flooring and everything else that goes with um some of the lodges and that yeah yeah uh, the whole freemason thing's fascinating because clearly something's going on there on a global plane scale but I just want to say, I don't think like my mate that goes down the local lodge is up to any shenanigan. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think they have a great time. They, they love, they're doing it for company. And um, I don't think they massively get this secret knowledge simply because. Well, I, I'm like you. I, I look at when, when you were talking about the, the people in Hollywood, the stars doing all these different signs and, you know, doing all that and everything else. I mean, I know they say in sign language, that means love and the hidden, the hidden hand. There's so much of it. And, and like you, I was thinking, yeah, it's, it's happening quite often. And, um, you know, that they're, they're, you know, whether it's a fad they're going through or what, it's, it's certainly a very uh, common trend that's going on and um, message. It seems to be um, been brought to us. Yes, I think the whole Hollywood thing and the music industry is there's so many fascinating uh, creative talents out there. There's, you, you just go to an open mic night and you see people that should have a bloody record deal, you know, just playing yeah. ac acoustic guitar or something. And you've got so many of these individuals that they get to a glass ceiling. They, they can't go any higher because there's just yeah. so many with that talent. And then, of course, the... Um, the industry comes in and says, right, we'll, Rich, we'll let you through. You've got to start like joining our, um, you know, jo joining our club, mate. And you've got to sign here in. in yeah, doing the, yeah, the hidden hand. And, uh, yeah. And then, yeah. Of, uh, 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 and why, if anyone's saying, why, could, what, why do they need to? Well, it's because the, uh, my personal belief is the mental heads that are trying to control everything. This small group of, you know, greed, let's just call them greedy little men, probably a few women in there as well. They, they want the music industry to be pushing the dark side it, it, surreptitiously. You know, I noticed when I went to Glastonbury, they started to put horns on the stages. You know, they started to, you started to see the Masonic symbol in, in, in everything. They started to get um, American artists, which were, Glastonbury is like a folk festival and they're suddenly yeah. getting these number one American artists and, and well, they were saying about Mr. Evis, weren't they? They were saying that um, he was, they were some arguments that he's a Freemason and that there's all this stuff going on. I mean, I, I do know um, uh, Michael Evis' daughter, so I know that they're, they're quite an ordinary family, so I don't know if that's any truth for that, I'll say that, you know. But um, there, there was a lot on the stage. There was a lot of symbolism. I, you know, I noticed that as well. Well, it's, it's pyramid stage on a ley yeah. line with thousands of, of adoring people pouring their energy into these, what, what in scriptures they'd call false idols. Um, and it, it, somewhere in there, it's demonic. <laughs> it, 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 it's the whole setup of, 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 of it. I mean, it. You know, it's why when Stephen King was a struggling school teacher, 
and his scripts get his you know manuscripts just kept getting chucked in the bin by publishers and they wrote mm. Carrie a highly you know arguably satanic document and he got a phone call from his um his agent went right Stephen you better sit yourself down they've offered you an advance so he's thinking what like you know $250 or something he went three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> um uh, what's the name the um one that writes the harry potter uh, jk rowling yeah, yeah. again yeah. and folks yeah. out there know i'm not trying to say jo jk rowling is a satanist not at all no. she's a wonderful bloody good good author but of course what's the theme it's a cult and it's put out a very junior junior level um and all, all of this ties in. It, it just, it, you know, you're not watching movies and listening to songs about, I woke up in the morning, I smiled at the sun because life is perfect and so am I and I want for nothing, I need nothing, I just need to express love to my fellow human human beings and, and be grateful for this time on the planet. Oh, no. It's I, th I think it is funny because I... I try to be skeptic and open-minded with the 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 um ghosts and when i people say to me about the ouija board i mean immediately everyone gets fearful of using the ouija board and i say that to me the ouija board is nothing but them sub they're, they're unconsciously moving the glass and i i don't think there's anything um more than that to it but then i but then when you go on to kind of like the fact of secret societies and other things going on and esoteric and all the other things I deep down know that there, there is more to that, you know, which we don't always know about. And um, I know when I've gone and done, um, I mean, they leave me alone in haunted places. And some of these places have been quite well to do. And uh, one of the places is a stately home. And he was friends with Prince Charles and all that. And some of the things in there, the books in the library, very occult and very much into to all this kind of thing, Freemasonry and talking about it and stuff. So, um, you know, it doesn't... I, it, doesn't it's not that incredible to think that there is something behind the scene that that we just the ordinary guy doesn't know about you know yeah massive and we've all been there i mean i went for god um i went for a long period in my life as incredibly naive and, and it's what led to me almost destroying myself through addiction is i just mm. couldn't see the right and right you know right in front of me and it it took a let's just call it a certain global event where um airplanes started to fly into things that they weren't supposed to or, or allegedly uh, that that along with recovering from addiction the the two sets of knowledge started to say bloody hell chris you've been living in a freaking dream world mate it, it, life is not life is just not what you thought you thought it was um, it's, fun, it's funny you say that, Chris, because I was brought up in a very religious movement. My my family were very religious, and um, I didn't find out till I was about forty that the father had brought me up. I had my suspicions, but I found he wasn't my real birth father, and that he was actually, you know, I'd lived this lie, believing that he, I was been, and they were my half brothers and sisters. As soon as they found out I was the milkman's child, saying they all disowned me, they didn't want nothing to do with me, and they're very they tend to be very devout religious people, which is why I don't have a lot of time for people that claim to be Christians, you know, um, sometimes. Not, not. I mean, there are good ones, but the, my particular family weren't that Christian about things. And um, I said to said to my wife at the time, it was like I was like Tarzan in the jungle. I, I got into addiction and I suddenly come out of everything and started to say, wow, the life I've been living is not as it is. This, you know, I've been living in this dream world. And... Um, I'm starting to awaken to things and starting to get involved in what I do with the ghosts and everything else. And um, it's opened so many doors for me as well, which has made me think, you know, is there such a thing, you know, when they say about serendipity, you know, things happen for a reason, you know, it does make you think it's all planned and going the right way now that I'm off addiction. It just seems amazing the doors are open. Yes. Did Sorry. Rich, I'm just trying to get something on the screen here, and my mind wandered for a sec. Did you say you've been through addiction? Or 
Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that that would explain the mental health work yeah. that you do or advocacy. Yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, I, I, I um, I mean, I, I kind of went for a bad divorce, but when I got away from the religion I was brought up in, they were very. I mean, I think I, I think it's okay for me to say the religion without causing any um, problems um, for anything. But my fa my family were brought up in a Salvation Army, which is a very very um, deep religion. You know, they 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 um, they, they go around playing their uh, their brass instruments at Christmas, collecting collecting from people. And where I was brought up, it was very very deep, very sort of um, uh, cult like, and everything. Uh, and it didn't seem to be the way it should be. And there was things that went on there. That's all I can say is things went on there that shouldn't have gone on. And I reported those things. And when I become a police officer, I even made sure that they were reported again. And for all the things that I came across in my life, I then turned to alcohol and I went way over the top with it. And um, I think it was when I met my second wife, it was, um, it was like a, a amazing moment. I just suddenly realized I'd hit rock bottom and I met my, my dear wife that I'm with now and suddenly I, I got on my track and I've not looked back. But um, I've always been aware of that addictive side because it's always there, you know. Um, I, think you, I think you've had a recent problem where you've had um, some pain, haven't you, from an accident that you've had and you said that you were on, um, is it um, cocodamol or, or those uh, kind of... Something the, much, 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 much stronger, mate. Yeah, more, more Morphine, something like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I have to be careful with morphine and, and tablets like that because I feel that the addictive side, it was like um, I've just got the addictive side in me, that everything has got to be one or the other. And I found that if I took painkillers, I like the feel of it, as you do, and you go down that road and you, you end up thinking, oh, this is good. You know, I don't need to feel that pain at the moment. I don't need to feel that. I don't need to feel anything. You know, this makes me feel good, but it's not. It's, it's, it's false. Mm. It's not real. And um, I learned that, you know, you have to face pain. You have to face your demons. You have to face the things that rightly or wrongly have happened to you in the past. And um, that's what I did. And, and it did help me when I became a police officer because often I'd be taken, because I always believed that when you, when I did my job as or role in it, I believe that there were other colleagues that took the uniform. They said, I'm, I'm wearing a police uniform. I'm God, you know, and there were colleagues like that. You know, they really took advantage of it. But I always believed that when I was a police officer, once I had a person in custody, they'd taken the punishment. You treated them just like you treat anybody else. And I remember one said to me, what can I do with my life? You know, what can I do? And I found it was a moment I could just turn around him and say, turn it around. I did, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I've been been through that myself yes it's a great wake up when you when you get to the point in your downward spiral you you can't go any lower you're set to lose even more than you've lost already and then you then you suddenly get it you suddenly yeah. get it and a great metaphor for understanding like the prescription medication thing is when talk people talk about god and the devil and I'm talking purely metaphor or allegorically yeah, yeah. here, folks. I don't think there's a guy with a bloody mm. spear or a trident sitting on a one cloud and there's a guy with a wispy. No, mm. it's about when you take that pain medication, then when you start to take advantage of it because it makes you feel good, this, this is the allegory. This is the devil coming in, you know, telling you, yeah, yeah, it's all right, da, 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 da. And physically on your body, it stops you vibrating at the, the correct frequency because, like you say, it's it it's false. And it's if we want to use the word God, it's taking you away from from God. And as as you as you process that mentally, you start to go into a negative energy. So, for example, when I took the, this pain medication, suddenly I start thinking about having a beer. You know, oh, a beer would be nice. You know, I could go out with, you know, and it's, whoa. And, and, and that's it, is you start to go to the, the, the your lower self, if we're talking sp yeah. in, in spir yeah. spiritual terms, you, you're going to your animal self. You're starting to look for instant gratification rather than living in your higher self and making that connection with something extremely powerful. And fascinating what you, 
uh, this is why I'm really quite sorry, Rich. I'm I'm really protective about addiction. I mean, we've been so brainwashed about what we're supposed to do in life and what we're not. And yeah, yeah. When people say, "Oh, Chris, you know, you put you you." you um you you got your life back together it's like i appreciate it i i, I get it but i yeah i, I never yeah. did anything wrong i just went through yeah. an experience exactly yeah and, yeah. It, and it's experience that off the back of that it's it's put me in paradise i i, I live a you know a perfect perfect yeah. life um i'm not talking materialistically here folks i'm, I'm no i i i, I know it, and I, I don't know if it's you know, I, I think people go through it in other ways, but I think if you've really been through addiction, that's when you really appreciate and really recognise. I know when you were speaking to to Robbie, I could identify straight away with both of you what you were on about because um, that's when I think I contacted you as well because I thought, wow, you know that that that's how I feel, you know. And um, there's moments when you're thinking, I'm so alive, I feel so alive, you know. And I remember a counsellor saying to me when I first started to give up the drink, he said, "You're not sober yet." And that was very interesting, those words, you're not sober yet. And I said, well, I've given up the drink. He said, but you're not sober yet. Your mind is not clear of all the other things. And and I, and, I, and now I can look back and say, you were right. But I am now, you know. Um, and and I, But I'm always aware. I'm always aware that it's there. You know, I'm always thinking to myself. And, I, and anyone that's going through it, I would always say, be aware of, of the fact that, you know, we're all going to get those days when it's hell. Um, I liked it when you got in the barrel of water, actually, because um, that cold water that morning, I think you did it on um, one of your videos. And It's, um, it's actually full of whiskey, mate. Whiskey? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and my great, <laughs> my great uncle, um, you know, he always said to me, like, you know, just um, get up, get on with it. And he was somebody who was in the, in the, the First World War, you know, went through all the trenches, um, went through everything, and uh, he understood you know, and he was like a father figure to me. Mm. So, excuse me. Yes, it's it's very simple to make the powerful connection that that gives you a paradise life. I don't mean a life without challenges, folks. You you mm. know, life is challenge. It's the way that you you um, accept and deal with it. And a simple thing like a cold shower in the morning, and I don't mean you have to stand in a you know minus two for like half an hour no just a quick turn your shower at the end of it just start turning a bit cold bear it as long as you can you build up it's so simple it it takes yeah. probably 20 to 30 seconds of cold water and it enables you it, it brings you back to your hunter gatherer your primal self when you would have lived in rain or you know if you were lucky you might have found a cave but it's yeah. there for a reason, you know. Uh, our body processes everything, and 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 through evolution, it cleverly adopt uh, adopts it for the good. The same with fasting. Oh, why do you want to go without? Because our ancestors would have gone without food for weeks at a time, possibly when they're moving between, hunt, you know, um, gathering ground. I say gathering, because, um, and so that little cold shower in the morning puts me in paradise it's so everyone can do it everybody i have the green smoothie at lunchtime because i want my body i haven't got my little ph strips with me but i want my body to to, to be 7.25 alkalinity or acid you know yeah. or, or, um like my hunter gatherer ancestors would have been for thousands upon thousands of of, of years and again takes about six minutes to make a green smoothie anybody can do it so yes fascinating rich it's it's all all fascinating this this rich tapestry of life that's hidden from us from birth hidden from through our education hidden by the 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 construct that we're put in by the mainstream media you know that six o'clock is east enders or whatever and then we got strictly and then yeah. we go back to work we do you know possibly a boring job that we don't really like but we yeah. got strictly tonight we got football at the weekend and you stay in that little mini matrix you do yeah you do you do and um and i think also add on that i mean not saying that that i don't want to knock people that are religious or, or believe in anything but where that religion came in was, you know, that also was another thing that 
was kind of almost restrictive to me. You know, it was kind of um, making me think, and I was rebellious. And I thought, why am I rebellious? And I realized part of the reason I was rebellious because um, my father, the, the, the father brought me up, it was his religion. And I, I wasn't his real biological son. So that probably was in me anyway to be that rebellious on it. But I questioned it and I, and I looked at it and thought, but none of the people question it. They're all in there with their uniforms on, praying, not behaving as Christians should sometimes. And none of them are actually saying, well, why am I doing this? Why, if I was in China, I'd be doing something different. If I was, you know, none of them were questioning there. And I think questioning is good, you know, that you question, why do I have to watch that EastEnders, at, you know, at night? Or why do I have to, you know, do this certain thing or have tea, dinner at a certain time? And, you know, and, and look outside the box and think of life. You know, I think, I think it, it really does wake you up. Yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd say, Richard, and friends at home, we're not knocking anybody here. But this is just a conversation. Um, if someone gets up, goes to work, and they want to watch their Strictly, and that's that, yeah, yeah, absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. In fact, to be honest, there's a little bit, bit of me that's a bit envious. The problem is for for Rich and I is that like that that matrix that we're in, that construct, it, it nearly killed us. It something wasn't right about it and when you you're going to die through substance misuse whether that be alcohol prescription meds whatever you've got to work out some answers for yourself you've got to get yourself out of there you've got to start thinking and putting the puzzle together and what the scriptures do is give you all the answers but here's the thing i think it was Jesus' disciples said to him, you know, why are you not, why don't you just tell us how we get to spiritual, you know, how do we make this connect? And he said, he said, I'm giving you milk because you're not ready for the meat. And this is the thing about religion is it keeps you in that milk stage. It's, 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 it's not what religion, it's not what the scriptures are about. They're not meant to be taken literally. You know, you can't be believing that, that a woman can have a baby without having sex. It's just, it's, you know, you can't be believing that a man walked on water. That's not what it's about. It's allegorical. You know, uh, um, the term Israelites, is it refers to um, people when they're sort of having their awakening, they, 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 they've sort of stepped over the threshold, the thinking threshold. They're starting to realize there's something bigger. So the Israelites, they 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 had, uh, had a mass exodus to Egypt. Egypt was like your thinking ground. Um, you know, it, 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 to put it in modern um, uh, terms, that's like your people that are on YouTube because they're looking for these videos that can just give them something more. Yeah. You know, just give them some some something more. Um, Moses, it's not a bloke. Moses is, uh, I think, literally translated is is your your moral self, your moral compass. Um, so when he raises his staff, the staff stands for uprightness. You know, being upright. For example, when you meditate, you sit there, you sit upright. That's when the 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 answers come to you. And he he puts his staff forward and parts. Was it the Red Sea? Yeah. symbolic of the blood of Christ not a man Christ is a is a is a chemical substance that's produced in the brain it's serotonin I believe and and also um, DMT and when you when you get the answers in life and you live the good diet and you, your thoughts are pure and all you have is love for your fellow man you enter this different stage where your brain makes different chemicals and so when he's parting the sea He's parting the blood of Christ to let let these individuals that have done the thinking enter the promised land. It's not a place. It's not in Palestine for crying out loud. Or, um, it, it, it's a state of being. They call it the land of milk and honey. Milk being uh, like serotonin, being like a milky substance. DMT being like a honey like 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 like. You know, they knew more about the brain back then than we. Than, than we do now it's all been cut out of the curriculum on purpose because they don't want people to, to, to know this rich do they you know um it, it, it's utterly utterly fascinating 
he's got his staff and it's got a snake on it and they're, they're praying to this golden calf. That represents they're praying to a false idol to get their answers in life. And Moses... I mean, I, and I think that's so true. Often when you see people in a the church, there was a vicar that was very, very good when he turned around to the people in the church and he said, this church is dead and I want you to see the corpses in the church. And he held a mirror up to the, the people in the church. And they looked at it, well, well we, come, we come on a Sunday, we do this, we do that. No, 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 we don't really grasp what it's all about, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was quite a rebellious um, vicar, but, you know, it was, and, and that's, that's what I found with looking. I always looked to, people said to me, I question too much. I look into deeply. And I think people that are, um, have an addictive personality are very serious thinkers. I think a lot of us are. We tend to, be on the same wavelength almost. I mean, like, you know, and, and you do think like deep, deep about things and, and, and about, and then sometimes that was where we probably were victim of our own. If, if does that make sense? The addiction kind of came because it, it was frightening sometimes to actually know that you, you know, you question things and there might be this answer and that answer, and you would stand out differently to everyone. And you were frightened of that. So addiction was the easy cop out, you know, well, let's get, Let's forget it. I don't want to think, you know, I just want to get drunk. I want to take whatever drug and I just don't want to think. I don't want to communicate with people um, because if I do, I, you know, and, and, and I realized that, you know, I didn't need to be afraid anymore. I didn't need the Dutch courage. I could say these things and believe these things and talk about these things. I mean, I don't care if people say, I'm, I you know, think you're the same, Chris. I don't care if people think I'm mad for what I think or believe now um, because it's something that I got through through recovery and, and through opening opening my eyes to things. Yes. We've got to get you up to the next level, Rich, is 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 um it's not what people are thinking because you are them and they are you. We're all a carbon molecular based structure. So he, he, here's how it is. God's up there, right? In a void because no, there's nothing. He's a bit bored. He hasn't invented the PlayStation yet, so he's, you know, he thinks, right, what can I do? Ah, i got an idea. Why don't I create life, right? You know, why don't I, I, I create a universe? And the ultimate goal of this is as life evolves very cleverly, you know, through evolution, chemical processes, could life become clever enough to understand it's me, you know? Could life become clever enough to have the intelligence to go, hang on, trace this? We're all universe. That 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 is it. And what what's happened here is, and I always refer to it, it's like, you know, if you've got two rocks on the beach and they're talking to each other, and then you know, they're both, I don't know name a black rock but whatever you know this rock's going hello fred you know i'm a rock but i'm i'm pretty cool you know i i, I do this job i earn this money i drive this car i like part my hair this way because i look a bit cool for the ladies and you know, and, and the other rock goes yeah well i'm i'm a rock and you know i'm thinking of changing my name to cedric because it's got a ring to it and and i i like gardening at the week you'd go Guys, you you like rocks on it. You 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 you're both the same. You yeah. split up. You, you, you. With humans, we don't realize that's what's happened through evolution. The universe has grown us like this, but we've we, we've come out of the universe through evo evolutionary processes. We got this sloshy stuff in our head called a brain. There's a chemical. Uh, there's a electromagnetism running through mm -hmm. it because when we feed ourselves, it, it creates this energy. Uh, it allowed us to create memory cells so we could remember things and then we can look back and reflect on that memory to make sense of the world. And the ultimate goal of God when he's up there bored because he hadn't got his PlayStation yet is can I build something here that gets clever enough to realise it's me? And, of yeah. course, what happens is the the, you know, these corporate trillionaire mentalists that can't experience love, so they've got no, no, you know, 
our whole goal in life is to be loved and to love. That's it, yeah, right? Yeah. They, they, they can't experience that. They don't have the empathy gene or whatever it is. So they go for the power. They want to control the whole goddamn show because they're a bit angry. They can't be like, they can't hold a baby and go, oh, goo 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 goo. They don't have that feeling. And so through our education, they start cutting us off from this higher power, uh, which leads you to understand that you are it, you know? And yeah. so our education doesn't teach us kindness, empathy, understanding, um, nanoscience to the part of, you know, molecular structure, um, uh, uh, simulation theory, all the, all this kind of stuff. It teaches you that you're rich and I'm Chris. You wear that hat. I wear mine at a, like a, a, ja yeah, a jaunty yeah. angle. Um, hey, don't you dare say that about me. Look, you know, I've got a bloody Rolex on my arm and I'm, I'm a little bit better than you, mate. The, no. You're me, Rich, and I'm you. We, we, you, you know. I love you, and I hope you love me because I, yeah. I want the best for you. I just want the best. But what we're seeing in, in, you know, like in Ukraine at the minute, it's the ultimate cutting mm. us off from realizing we're all the same. We're all universe, and um, this is enlightenment, folks. This is what when you hear the term enlightenment, because we've all been brainwashed from birth. You think of some little. Buddhist in an orange robe chanting in a in a monastery, you know, yeah. and, and you think it makes no sense to you. Um, and oh, hang on. Yeah, hello, Steve. Yeah, the deal. Yeah, yeah. I, how much do I get out of it? Four million. No, 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 no. I make my time's worth more than that. If tell them to make it twenty-five million, and I'll consider it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Sorry, that's my accountant. Um, business issues. You know how it is. Um, but yeah, what a lovely conversation, Rich. Thank you so much. You know, it, 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 this is why. You, you've obviously been through childhood trauma. Um, the simple fact of realizing your parents are not actually and off the bat. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't mind admitting to people I've got a thing called OCD as well. As I said, I mean, I joke about it as well, Mike. I mean, Catherine Tate did a very good. That's why I say you can laugh about things as well, and I don't mind laughing about it because the more you laugh at yourself as well, the more better you feel. Um, but I do have OCD, and I have. Um, I've had that since I was a very young child through the trauma and I've had to kind of get to understand why the brain's been like that, you know? So, yeah. It's because when you're traumatized and you grow up with this childhood, you know, you, you, you desperately have a need to control things, you know, what, what yeah. you can control in your little mini universe. Cause you don't want the pain. You, you, you know, you're, you're fighting underlying trauma and you don't even know it's there. But it manifests in like, right, you know, I, I need to control things. I, I can't let things, you know, yeah. the, the alcohol is a great example. You know, I drink this. I feel good. I, I have control over how, you know, how, how, how I feel. Gosh. But back to the ghost stuff then, Rich, have you ever been in a situation where you thought, oh, actually, maybe there is some, some, something here? I'll tell you a funny story, and it is a very, very peculiar one. Um, I was um, in a uh, an old church, and um, there was a person with me, and um, they don't normally say this kind of thing. She said, I keep get getting the name Mary all the time. Uh, Mary keeps coming to mind. I said, well, that's interesting. And suddenly, we heard a voice out in the graveyard, and, and this is no word of a lie, I, but I'll tell you the full story, and then you'll understand why. I looked out, and he said, I'm looking for me grave. So we kind of, I, I turned around to him, to her and said, I don't think I want to open the, the church door now. Perhaps we've actually finally come across a real live ghost. But there was a, a house next door where um, people um, with um, dementia, so the, the, the house next door, we used the toilets there. So I understood that this gentleman was probably come out from there, but this was three o'clock in the morning. But what was interesting is he was carrying a oil painting, and this is no word of a lie, and the oil painting was the Virgin Mary. 
So where this woman had been saying, I'm getting the name Mary, I thought, well, that's a bit peculiar. Took him back to the house and um, the, the ladies come to the door. Do you want to use the toilet in the... No, no, that's fine. And I pointed to the gentleman and he just went on upstairs. And the lady afterwards said to me, they didn't really take much notice that that guy was out in the, you know, that we brought that guy back. And I said, do you think we've really been with a ghost <laughs> or walked with a ghost? Because um, why I say that, a good friend of mine was a security guard officer and he was in a, an old, um, it was an old uh, Air, Air Force um, base. And um, he was one day just at the reception there. And this gentleman come up to him, immaculately dressed in the, and it looked like Second World War, you know, RAF pilot. And he said, I'm just off to the, uh, my plane, old chap. And he said, okay. So he went off. He thought, oh, it's very strange, very, you know, somebody winding me up or something. And anyway, a load of people turned up to the desk. And he said, I've just seen, they said, oh, you've seen the ghost, they said. And he, and he said to me, he was just like you and I, physical body. So um, have I seen a ghost? I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe I did. Maybe we do every day. We are out and we beat people. But, you know, I, I've never really come across anything that I can just about explain. That's what I'd say. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And is this a mental thing? Is it some sort of condition? Can we condition, you know, through our life traumas, perhaps we things manifest that can't can't be. I mean, how many children have an invisible friend? Yeah. Fascinating. It's a very common one is that, you know, people say that children see ghosts, but, um, you know, they, they have the invisible friend or they see somebody. And, you know, I can remember as a child, I mean, um, I used to stay at my great uncle's house down in Devon and he had the, the bedroom done exactly as his wife had it, my auntie, mm -hmm. um, because he missed her, you know, he was, he missed. And I used to go in there at night and I used to feel scared to death. I was going to, see a ghost or something like that so um, i can remember those feelings as a child as well so mm. one yeah. sec mate um steve yeah you know, go out, go and grab something to eat after this you you gonna pay thanks mate oh yeah after the podcast sorry mate um yes Tell us what it's like, because this is kind of a fact. What's it like working with the TV companies? Well, I, I, I didn't actually go ahead with the production, but um, working with the TV companies is very much, um, you know, they want action. They want things to happen. Um, and my particular experience, and I, I, I've, got, I've signed no contracts, so I can say this, um, my particular experience was when I went to uh, an old... Um, is an old hippodrome. They said to me, um, you know, one of somebody chucked something or threw something. They said, can you just make out that was something thrown, you know? And so that I believe that, you know, they are very much for the television, very much for the excitement. And, um, you know, it, it, I would like to do a documentary maybe or something a bit more serious. And that would probably be a bit better. But um, these TV shows, I think you've got to take them with a pinch of salt. Do the, the 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 sort of camera crew and all that are they sort of all they're healthily sceptic? Are they? They are very very sceptical, but a lot of people are sceptical because they are afraid. To, I mean, I, I took a radio station out to uh, a theatre where the ghost apparently is seen in the dressing room, and I took these two DJs out um, and I challenged them that one of them was going to spend the night alone in this. Um, dressing room and they were absolutely fine about it they were joking about it until it got to the bit where he had to be on his own in the dressing room and the light app was out and he was left alone with the camera and when he was in there he wanted to get out as quick as possible but he was trying trying like mad to say you know i don't believe in anything you know and um try and get around it that way oh hang on mate got something going on here yeah thank you yeah okay Sorry, some people say this this studio's possessed. <laughs> um, what um, with the mental health side of things, are you involved in anything specific, or are you are you just a um, simple? Just bring a, just bring awareness to it. Um, I've I've um, interviewed many people. I mean, what came along in my life was um, a long time ago. I 
I was leaving, a, well, it was my girlfriend at the time, I was leaving her house and um, there was a young lad in a phone box and um, he was crying his eyes out. And I, and I said to him, you okay, mate, as you do, you know, and he said, it's drugs. And I thought, it, you know, it was heavy drugs. And he said, no, I've taken an overdose. And um, I took over on the call, the Samaritan wanted to keep him on the phone. And I said, no, he needs an ambulance. So I didn't know anything about first aid. And I sat with him um, in the curbside and sadly I knew he wasn't going to make it. And um, I heard a few days later that he had died. And I said, and my words were, his last words to me was, I wish I'd never done this. And it stayed with me. And I said it in the, the, the court, you know, what he said at the coroner's court. And the parents said, thank you for that. They said, because it made us realize he didn't mean to do it. You know, that those words were said and that, that stayed with me for life. And it's always been there that, you know, so many people pass people by or, or don't listen to people when they've got mental illness. And, um, I think it kind of, um, made me very determined that I would bring awareness to it through, I'm often on radio or I'm Often I'm in magazines about ghosts and things. And I thought, well, can I use that time also to kind of just bring awareness, you know, and that's what I'm hoping to do, is do a podcast to interview people that have been through it and, and various things. And that's what I'm looking to, to, to bring soon, really. Oh, mate, you've been through a lot. That's um, pretty full on, hey? And you, you, you dealt with it ab- ab- admirably. It's a bit like, have you seen that? Well, there's probably a few videos out there, but that there's one video. I think it's called the Bridge, and it's about the um, is it the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco? That that big orange yeah. thing. And there's one dude. He's just got a camera on it, twenty four seven. He's got a camera set up yeah. outside his house, and it and it just films the bridge. And he'll zoom in on people that are just they start to loiter on the bridge and you just know that they're going through a mental health crisis and they're sort of next thing they step up to the, the, the wall of, you know, the, yeah, whatever it's called along and then they're sort and then the next thing they're climbing over it and, and some of them jump, some of them get grabbed by people and they, 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 they talk. It's a friends. If you're out there, I don't, don't watch it if you're in a bad mind state, mm. but, um, there's one chap that he jumped and as soon as he'd fallen you know, five, 10 feet, he realized, Oh my God, I don't want to die. Yeah. And fortunately he, he hit the water and, and, and he survived and they somehow got a boat out to him and, and, um, and, and they rescued him. And I just say to anyone out there, you know, life's not meant to be, easy easy it, it's meant to be a, a, a challenge and sometimes it does come on full on but everybody is loved you know you're you're loved so much more than than you know um i love you all my crew love you i'm sure rich loves you yeah. and and this is not the way it will pass yeah tough times pass it's just a challenge that's been sent and when you get over it, you'll be, uh, I don't want to say a better person because you're perfect now, but you'll, you'll start to get it all in perspective and, and, um, tough times never last friends, you know, yeah. they never last. You, you, I often think they're like clouds that float. Thoughts are like clouds that floating by and, um, they will go and the sun will come forward and you, and you will, like you say, you will, um, learn from from those experiences and you will you will be better you you will you know you will find a better time again and and it's just worth keeping that in mind and that and lesson was those words when that lad said to me i wish i'd never done it you know that 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 said it all you know yes it happens quite a lot in the military um the chap i shared a room with in northern ireland he's always used to be telling me about his his missus, as we would term it back in the day, well, my missus, you know, and I remember him saying, she's upset because we never get any time together. I'm always on deployment. You know, last year I had three months at home and we just married. And and um, the next thing I knew, when we got back from Northern Ireland, he'd um, he'd taken his life in, in, in the car, you know, he'd gassed himself not, not far from where I lived and, and um, 
another chap when I was on HMS Invincible. There was this young officer, and he was from somewhere obscure, some like like I don't know Tasmania or, 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 or somewhere. And he came up, and there's always that thing in the military that if you're in the Marines, you're kind of held in like quite high regard by mm. your fellow services, and they quite like want to be your mate and all this sort of stuff. And and um, some naval officers will be like dickheads, you know treat you like a piece of whatnot and but he wasn't we had this job to do on ship one day i, I think we we're moving some bloody missiles or something <laughs> and he's like all right fellas right listen i ain't gonna tell you what to do you know you're all grown marines just this this is a job let's just crack on it and i just remember thinking what a lovely bloke you know what a, what a nice if all officers could be like that it would be just a wonder much much better job to be in and bloody hell he hung himself like about three days later yeah. there's me thinking what a wonderful guy i really like this officer you know and, and and he didn't know that he didn't know that i'm thinking that he's obviously in such a they couldn't find his next <coughs> next of kin because he came from somewhere um obscure and we had another chap um shot himself whilst on guard duty and the rumor was that he'd been taking steroids and and that someone had said to him oi your training team have found out your your and uh, he was so petrified of the constant you know i mean something so stupid like that who yeah. gives a f f you know i i, I don't i mean because i my job before this um i worked in um kind of like a government well it was a like a job center kind of role and i i used to help some of the ex-military get back into to to work and everything and some of the struggles they went through and i had a lot of friends from that and going through awful things and you know the, the mental health and um and everything else which um you know which i realized they they needed that help that support you know getting back into i mean it, and again in the police force you get it as well you know you still get that kind of um thing but not so much but more in the military and that's why i always hold my my hat up to to you guys in the military and, and what you've done and what you've been through and 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 it's funny because i a friend of mine was a, a marine and he turned around to me one day and said you know what he said you you you're um you've been through a lot in 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 life and i said yeah i said but not what you've been through and he said it doesn't matter he said i can see in your eyes that you've got pain and i thought that was really uncanny i don't know if you've ever come across that but he could really re read almost the you know the things and and he he was a great um support yeah when i was in hong kong mate we we used to work in this bizarre computer company selling memory chips and i never sold a single one because i didn't speak cantonese that well <laughs> And the boss didn't really care. He just wanted some white, white Western faces in his office so that when customers flew in from abroad, it looked like he was Billy Big Bollocks in the, in the memory chip business. Yeah. Look, look, I've got all these staff and half of them are Westerners. We're... Anyway, after like a 12-hour day, I think we used to work. It was ridiculous. Um, we used to go and hit a nearby Dai Pai Dong, which is an out, outdoor restaurant. And the, the incredible, you sit there in the tropical heat, tucking into bloody lobster and crab and drinking these litre bottles of, you know, nice. <laughs> sing sao or whatever that, yeah. and, and just chatting to the people around you. And one chap leaned over and introduced himself, gave me his business card, always presented in, a, in well, Chinese culture with both hands as a, as a sign of respect, and you take it with both hands. Yeah. And it said... Um, Laurie Kong, triad police. <laughs> so I was like fascinated. You know, we, we cracked up. We met these guys several times. And one time, one of them turned to me and said, uh, uh, Quissa, um, this is Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee uh, is a chemist. And I turned and there's this chap like in, in all the traditional Chinese garb, which you clearly obviously don't get these days but it wasn't that long ago that everyone in you know the workers in hong kong wore the black pajamas and the big yeah. straw sun hat and this sort of thing and this guy's got a chong som which is your you beautifully woven you know garment whatever you call it comes down comes down to the feet and so uh, my friends this triad copper says um yeah uh, mr lee want to know 
can he read your hand? I'm like, yeah, sure. Of course, massively sceptical. I'm I'm yeah. 26 years old. I don't give a shit about all that sort of stuff. But I sat down and, I, and he looks at my hand and um, the chat translating says, uh, Mr. Lee say, um, you have some very difficult years ahead of you. But don't worry, when you reach 30 years old, everything will be good, right? I didn't think anything of it. Of course, I didn't. Then, of course, I went through the horrors of chronic addiction yeah. um, for the best part of two and a half years or whatever it was. And I remember my 30th birthday. So, the, you know, he said 30 years old. I was on a beach in Mozambique surrounded by my fellow um, uh, development instructors celebrating my birthday, a few beers and nice food. And they gave me this beautiful statue. And and I just thought back to Mr. Lee. I thought he had my number, didn't he? <laughs> he, he I hadn't even spoke to the bloke. He, he could see from the way I carried myself, probably I was trying to crack loads of jokes or what. He could see that deep down there, something's not right there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was going to go through the mill, but I was going to come out of it. And incredible, you know. It, there's a there's a lesson there for all of us, friends, isn't there? There is definitely. Yes. Let's talk about the police. Come on, uh, uh, am I allowed to talk about the police? Or are they the they the yeah. enemy? I'm not. I, I can't remember. <laughs> um, I, I I did a uh, I did several years in the police. I mean, I dealt with all sorts from there. I've dealt with. Um, Domestic abuse, sort of one of the worst things you deal with. Um, sometimes um, I, there isn't a lot to say, really. I, I mean, um, it's just general beat duty and, um, you know, uh, getting called out for various things. Um, mostly, um, you know, a lot of the time it was um, Saturday nights. They didn't look the same when you were in police uniform as they did when you were out of uniform. Um, you know, every Friday night it was, everyone was, um, crazy and drunk. And, um, when you were the other way around, you were crazy and drunk enjoying it. Um, but no, it was, it was a, it was a good experience. I, 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 um, found that I got disillusioned very quickly because, um, you know, it's, it was getting more then when I was there that the paperwork was becoming more and more and police officers weren't able, to, weren't able to do the things they wanted to do. And I think officers were frustrated. And I think that's true. And then there was, as you do in every job, you always got the one that, took, that thought their uniform made them godlike. You know, they were superior to everyone else. And um, I used to come and clash with them. I mean, I remember one officer, he's got his hand on the phone. I said, no, he hasn't. I can't see his hand on the phone. Well, I saw his hand, you know, and you always get one that was power happy. And that's unfortunate with everything. Um because I also then went on to airport security and um, I remember doing that job and there were people there that were very uh, power happy and used to search people's bags and think they were, um, they were the Queens, you know, they, they, they could just do anything. So, um, but it was a job, you know, and, and but it was, I, I did take it seriously. I mean, I think, I think I've always had that kind of help inside. I think that's come from with that young lad. I went in because I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference. And then I realized it's not quite like that. You can't make that difference. You, you can try, you know, you can try and be the best you are, you are at that job. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's not quite like, like you think. Yes. I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the wonderful police officers out there. Um, when I was struggling, I remember my parents calling the police on me because my behavior was it wasn't violent rich but they didn't understand it and they didn't yeah. understand why i was getting so acutely upset it's like i was going through so much don't don't criticize me anymore please you know don't yeah. don't and i remember i was in my parent my, my, my dad and he had a, had a stepmother at the time and and um it actually <laughs> I think it's in, in it's in my memoir, Forty Nights. So that one up up there, yeah. folks, the middle one. And my dad had come back from the pub. And he started to tell this story about we had a local, a bit like a feral sort of family. You know, I think all villages have their their you know 
there's like seven brothers and one girl and and they're all into crime and and they're always up in court and this sort of thing and what had happened is one of them had lost his driving license um he'd been up in court got got banned for driving and one night these the boys were walking to the pub don't know how many of them doesn't really matter but the police officer pulled up alongside him wound his window down and I don't know they all had they all, they all had names like Wayne and Wade and 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 he went all right Wade nice to see you walking meaning you know you've been banned from driving and they just turned on him right ripped him out of that car locked him in the boot took him up on the moors and and I don't want to say the word on a podcast but you can imagine what they, they what they did this guy thought he was going to you know this was the end sort of thing and anyway my dad came back from the pub and he starts to tell this story. But my dad doesn't know that a very similar thing happened to me in Hong Kong where I, um, I genuinely believe one day all the triads had turned on me. I worked in a, a, a nightclub as a doorman and it was run by the 14K triads over there. And um, one night I genuinely thought I'd been set up to be murdered and I went through the whole mental process of knowing that you're going to die, right? But I, this is in your first book as well, isn't it? Uh, I've yeah, got the book. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is in eating smoke, and I'm stood, yeah. stood there trying to like do my Dorman job and just keep keep cool, right? Yeah. What got me through it is ultimate. Like, it's fuck all wrong with me, you know. Mm. No one's no one's going to intimidate. You want to kill me? Fucking go. You know, I ain't gonna I ain't gonna scream. I ain't gonna beg. You know. Yeah. So I'm stood there and, and, and in that moment of knowing you're going to die, it's inexplicable. It's like a cold, sterile whiteness comes over you as, as you accept this is the, 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 the end. And obviously I didn't die. I, I'm still here to tell the tale. But so my dad's telling this story. But hey, do you hear about the boy, you know, the so-and-so gang were going to the pub and this copper and they put him in the boot and the poor guy thought he was going to I, I flipped, Rich. I couldn't yeah. I couldn't take it. And I had a plate of, I don't know, omelette and chips or something on my lap and, and, and I just went, no! And, and I th threw it all over the floor and as I ran out the house, my, my stepmother jumped on the phone and calls 999. She said, he's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. And I wasn't going to kill no one. I, I was just, <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. just like acutely upset. And next thing you know, blue lights and sirens are wailing. These cop cars are skidding to a stop outside this, this, my father's cottage. They're smashing through the gate, right? They come pin me up against the wall. And, um, and uh, just at that moment, by pure happenstance, my brother rocked up. So he jumps out his car. He's across that driveway in like two freaking steps. And he grabs this copper and he goes, there's nothing wrong with my brother. And they're like, it's okay. It's, o oh, it's okay. We, we, we just had a call. Um, someone said there was a dis disturbance at the house. It, 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 it's fine. And... So I talked to this one of the policemen and I just explained, look, I've come back from Hong Kong. I'm a bit broken. I'm, I'm chronically addicted to drum. I'm, it, it. And he said, listen, we ain't going to arrest you. You know, you've done nothing wrong. We, we, we just want you to get better. And he pulled a, he pulled a, a card out of his pocket and it was for a rehab. And he said, listen, yeah. he said, my brother was addicted to drugs and, um, these people re really helped him and he gave me the card and then nodded to his mates and, and they were yeah. off. And, and, I, and this is, yeah, I mean, uh, this is exactly what, you know, makes a good policeman. And, and, and um, that's exactly where people like ourselves that have been through these things can come into a job like that and can give that kind of support and help, you know? So I didn't want to finish Carry on saying what you were saying on the end of that. No, well, that's just it. I yeah. mean, imagine had that been a different copper, one who's driven by his ego. Yeah. Because the forces, whether they're military or play, they, they recruit from basically an ego pool, yeah. angry young people yeah. that want to prove themselves. Or, or um, 
you know, it could have been someone so different. It could have been right. No fucking drugs. That's all shit, yeah. mate. You, 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 that's against the. That's against the law. You know, we're taking you down the station. We're going to book you. You know, and, and my life could have gone horribly more wrong than it already was at that moment. And the fact that that copper did the job perfectly, what he was supposed to do. You know, they get they get a hound in these police and and quite deservedly so if you look back at the last 24 months what, oh, they, yeah. what they've been supporting is nothing less than criminal and it's all coming yeah. out now and everyone's starting to realize you know it, it, it um i mean this is the thing i mean because i mean i i the radio station said do you want to come on and and, and support that these things go on and i say that they do go on and uh, i'm not going to be one of those um former police officers, it says that they're, they're, they're all good because they're not. And that was what shocked me was sometimes the amount of egos in these organisations that, that that shouldn't be in the job, shouldn't be in that role, you know? Yeah, exactly. And um, as a podcaster, I get, obviously, I get about 500 messages a week, you know, emails and all this sort of stuff. And I have to be honest, the only ones that I've just, had to go yeah sorry it, it, it's been from policemen and it's where they've seen something in my show they haven't understood we're just coming from a position of love that's all you know this yeah. is why we and they've seen something and their egos kicked in it's like oh you can't talk about us like you know this incident you don't understand chris it's da -da -da. and it's like no we were the, we, the incident was irrelevant we would we were getting so much more out of it than the, like the minutiae of did this guy have mm. a backpack on or you know. and the, the the emails will read like right chris you know your, your guest the other day and and the guest is a woman so this is you know again the ego's kicking in you know this how mm. how dare a female police officer be saying such things and and it's like right you know what i want you to know is this and 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 i i think mate i'm not having you on my show sorry yeah i just i've come too far in life to you know i've just come um i don't need it i don't you know yeah i'll, I'll get one what well, sorry a little you know i'll get some military guy the other day writes to me on linkedin calls me a, a joker <laughs> I'm like, a joker because i don't believe that three freemasons got into a tin can filled it with fossil fuel and then went across three hundred thousand miles of uncharted space <laughs> and then when they got that you know when they're orbiting the moon and they say right mikey boy you hold this baby in orbit me and buzzy we're going to get into that piece of shit contraption there the, the, looks like a fucking homeless person shelter right we're going to get in it and then we're going to go across X amount of miles of uncharted space. We're going to land on a planet we have no idea of the physics of or whether that craft is, you know, um, oh, oh, was it a super technology is going to get you there, Buzz? Uh, no, actually, we got less technology than a calculator. We got to, like, take that baby down ourselves. <laughs> All right, so when you land on the moon, are you going to do some serious scientific experiments here? Yeah? Oh no, we're gonna fuck around, knock a golf ball around, mate. <laughs> okay. Do you realise like in space that golf ball's never gonna come come back? You know, it's gonna go pretty far. Oh, don't worry about that, Mikey. We got we haven't told you. You seeing that piece of shit fucking homeless shelter that we're gonna go over there in? Yeah. There's a fucking car in there, mate. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. We brought a car with us. We're gonna, we'll we'll burn after the balls in the <laughs> it's Sorry if I sound a bit sceptical, but, and yeah, I get, I got a message of hate about it. <laughs> how dare I question the, you know, how dare I, 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 I get it all the time. I mean, when I, when I, um, question some of these ghost programs and things on, uh, YouTube, um, they show these, um, they're kitten balls and they, um, they're, they, they kind of flash when the kitten moves them, you know, just moving them and they're saying, Oh, I'm, talking to my auntie uh, Hilda or I'm talking to uh, Uncle Bertie and he's the ball's flashing, it's him speaking to me. And I'm saying, yeah, so you're <laughs> relying on your evidence, on your flashing balls, or I'll say something like that. And I get it all the time, you know, if I'm if I'm a bit um, 
bit crit- critical of those kind of things. So, yes, uh, it's not so queer as folk, mate. They just, I mean, we we talk a little bit on this show about the flat Earth conspiracy or theory, whatever we're going to call it, and. I've had people that are really big in that movement. I mean, basically the top top guy, I'm not going to say his name, but has asked me to come on the show. And it's like I've had individuals on before and they try to tell me that Earth's flat. And I'm not here to like judge. I think it's great that people question reality, you know, question the status quo sure. because, yeah. um, you know, certain buildings with the uh, number seven attached to them kind of you know we've got to be awake to 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 such things and so i think it's great that people question but it's really hard for me when i've got um two mates that have been right around the planet you know one sir ranulph fines very loosely mm-hmm. affiliated with him, but he very kindly sent me a, a signed copy of his book when i ran the length of the country for for charity and Ironically, it was right at the time I just uh, had a ticket to go and see him, go and see him speak, and I think he did it in the eighties, the Trans Globe expedition. Yeah, I think know? it was because I, I, I had one of the books. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, and then um, <clears throat> we've got I've got another another friend, an SAS captain, um, and he's was the second person to ski across Antarctica solo. Um, literally coming in uh, like a day behind a, an American chap that was 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 just just ahead of him. So they've clearly gone around the the, yeah. the, the planet to a point. I mean, not. And of course, I, I've been to Antarctica. I've been on expedition, scuba diving expedition to Antarctica. So when people go, "Oh, Chris, it's just an ice wall," it's like, dude, it's not. It's a continent. Yeah. When you step ashore, you step onto rock. It's it it it's rocks. It, it's a whole con. Yeah, yeah, but you're not allowed down there, mate, because the, the, there's an army, right? There's a, these armed guards. They're going to come and stop. No, no, it's a massive continent, massive. The chances, you know, of anybody seeing a small yacht dropping somebody, it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's like a needle in a haystack sort of scenario. And there's one chap went down there, a mil- military guy, and... Uh, you're supposed to get a permit for these trips, right? You're supposed to apply for a exploration permit and, 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 and off the back of that, you then arrange the plane that comes to pick you, pick you up. And, um, this chap went, ah, oh, fuck getting a permit. <laughs> he said, he just got his mates to drop him off with a, um, a kite and he kite skied across. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. He kite yeah. skied across Antarctica. Um, mm. And his, I, I don't know if he'd arranged a plane to pick him up, or whether his mates had to sail around. I, I, I don't know the the logistics of it all. But when I when I say this to these individuals, and, and it, it's like it just goes in that ear and literally comes out that without, without being processed. And I would call that. Sorry, folks, I'm not here to upset anyone, but I call that indoctrination or a, a cult like mentality. If, if I've just told you my mate's been around the planet like wouldn't you go oh fuck i didn't know that how does that this this is the problem with people when they've got this um like you say indoctrinated or they've got this deep belief and um where some people of the church have this one way of thinking and you try to tell them this other way and, and and they just won't listen and and um then you've got somebody that, and it works the other way as well. When you get a skeptic that's very skeptical or very scientific, where they won't listen to the fact that there may be something more. You know, some people are just closed-minded. I know what you mean. It's, um, yeah, it's a common thing. Yeah, exactly. And the whole thing with the religion thing is, you, 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 you're being slipped a Mickey. <laughs> you know, you're being slipped a Mickey. It, it, it's not. It's not what these churches are saying. It's so much more, and you can get so much more out of it by getting out of that narrative. And, you know, Christ, it, it refers to a, a state of consciousness. Um, it's not a person. I'm not saying that there wasn't a person called Yahshua or what. what I mean, they, 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 it seems they tie like four narratives into one. So you've got the astral, the, you know, solar system, 
equinox all this kind of stuff very quite cleverly wo woven into in, in into one story but essentially the the scriptures are a set of instructions for people that are ready to receive it to take you to the next you know the next level it's not it's not actually about a dude that walks on water um and well this is life isn't it all this knowledge hidden from us instead of understanding it instead of understanding the beauty of life that we're all just, we're all the same no we go to another country that's done nothing to us and we bomb it into the stone age mm. ignoring the fact we've just massacred god knows how many innocent yeah. men women and children and because our the box in the corner of our room is feeding us this you know continuing to slip us this mickey whilst brandon issuing the religious flag going you know this is we've got god but but behind us and and um gosh i i hope off the back of this podcast some you know one person goes oh it's that. just one person it's worth it mm. just for that one person to kind of um yeah see more to it yeah mm. gosh so rich what's what's next on your or what are you currently doing have you got well, have you got anything to promote please by all means I'm gonna. I'm gonna be probably next now that we've um, opened up to you know we've got rid of this uh, pandemic and everything that people can uh, actually go out and do things. Um, I'm probably going to be doing more of the challenges where um, I'm going to be left alone in haunted buildings. I mean, I, I hope to travel the world again and get in contact with various cultures and countries, and because I'm still meaning to write a book on that one. But um, the the next thing really is the podcast. I'm looking at a podcast where. I don't just cover the ghosts and the paranormal, but I cover a multitude of things and challenge things. And obviously uh, the mental health is one issue that I, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to, uh, to cover. Yes. I'm just um, flashing up your Twitter feed here so people can um, follow you at real Richard case. That's the one. Yeah. As opposed to that deluded guy who's going around thinking he's Richard case. <laughs> <laughs> or he's trying to scam. It, 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 it was funny because I think Chris, that was the only way I could get my name on it. <laughs> if I'm honest, whoops, no, I've admitted it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I've I spent hours literally trying to work out Twitter. To... You know which one's gonna. <laughs> There's so much more to it. You're an average person in the street. You're just like, yeah. right, I, I, I can't get my name. I'll just add a seven to the end or a twelve. Or the, that's, exactly. that's fine. Yeah. When, when you're a business, it's it's got to be a certain. You know, it's got to be someone something that people will search um it's got to be unique to you if you can't get your name you've got to kind of so yeah i i i, I get it you know um yes yes i'm looking at what's this stone a stone circle or something uh i need your help i need another 240 responses to my survey on pagan sacred places so rich what's a pagan because we hear that term and we we think of yeah I'm, pagan is basically um if you want it in simple terms it's any any the religion before the original religion so like um you've got christianity so they would say the belief before christianity was pagan anything before the official or you know it's it's a made-up name really because um it's like um you know, in in the, in the in America, you would have the Native Americans. They were the original people there. Their beliefs was the original faith or beliefs. The Native American beliefs were the original. And then you say, oh, now America's Christian. Oh, anything other than that is pagan. You know, it's before this recognized um, labels come in. So, um, yeah, but the, the other thing with pagan is it's been taken to a new level because um, – there are people that call themselves pagans and they're, they're, they're thinking they're witches and they go back to the original witchcraft of say the 16th, 1700s back in that time, but they're not, they're, they're a modern form of witchcraft. They've got their own kind of ideas on it. Um, and that came in say around about the seventies and that. So, yeah. What's it like when you're, um, how do you find public speaking? I don't, I don't find it that bad, actually. Um, it's probably because um, I've spoken to a lot of people uh, when I was in the church, actually. I think that's the only good thing that probably come out of it. But um, no, I, I've never found it a problem. Never found it a problem. Mm. Um, I find it sometimes easier to speak to people in an, as an audience than I do to stick a headphone on me and um, 
talk on a on a vlog or a blog. It's very funny, but um, yeah, I do find it sometimes easier when I'm speaking live to an audience. And do you ever have any? Do people challenge you on on certain? They do, they do. I mean, because I um, I, I tend to talk about folklore and about beliefs and all the traditional beliefs and witchcraft and you know people then want to get to the juicy bits have you seen a ghost you know um or um tell you what can i have a word afterwards i saw a ghost you know you get a lot of that you, you get a lot of the things like that when when you're doing it yeah it's hard isn't it when you do public stuff and um people want a piece of you obviously yeah. and and your time is kind of sometimes limited um I remember doing a book signing once in Hong Kong and the bookshop owner was just stood there going, because I just want to meet and greet everyone, you know, big, hug, right, big yeah. hug, tell them, must, you know, obviously they've got questions for me that I want to answer. And you can understand why they've got this um, system now where when you do your meet and greet, the, the celebrity stands there. He's got his own photographer all set up. So it's none of this, right, hang on, let me get me iphone oh no 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 it's pointing the wrong way let they don't do that they just stand there quickly higher shake hand off and it's all on their um memory stick and yeah. then they put it up on their website and you buy you buy your um yeah you buy your 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 picture it's um have you ever had public speaking go wrong yeah i i think i i didn't do a boris moment and start talking about Peg, was it Peg, Peg a Pig? I think he's, I can't remember what you're speaking about now. Um, yeah, I have had it go wrong and um, I've had the notes, but I often, I often speak without notes anyway. You know, I don't bother with notes um, because I find that, that they tend to go more wrong when you've got everything planned and you've got notes. You know, you're, you're going by them and it's like you're reading the notes. So you chuck them over your shoulder and start. I find that if you're if you've got an audience or you've it's like us talking now, it's a conversation you have with the people at the time, and if it's relevant to that time, then you don't need notes, you don't need to worry. But yeah, there have been times when I've got a bit tongue tied, and or um, I mean, the one thing that happened was when I had an audience that's very cold. I don't know if you've ever had that where they don't seem to react at all. And you think they're going to laugh? Okay, like I can sympathise with a comedian that has an audience that never laughs. That must be horrendous. And they're and they're po faced and they're all looking straight. And then at the end of it, they say that was a jolly good talk that you just done. You think, oh, all right then. I thought you didn't like it. <laughs> so um, yeah, we, it's we should give a big shout out to that lovely person in the audience that sits there smiling at you. And, and, yeah, and it, it, you always go to that one person, mm-hmm. always uh, just for reassurance. Yeah, yeah, I find it hard on zoom chats um because everyone's sort of i i it it's it's a byproduct of zoom is that when you're doing a talk everyone sort of sits there yeah and there's none of there's none of this you know the, and and sometimes i stop and guys are you get are you are you getting this <laughs> oh yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> oh okay i just thought for a minute <laughs> My last public speaking, I spoke at a, a, a race course up in the north. Um, it's a big business function. And I think when I got to the bit about the carbon molecules, that was where I maybe, I don't think, I don't think I lost the audience, but I was being, it was one of those ones where the chap interviews you, you know, asks you like 10 questions and, and, um, and I remember saying, right guys, this is, this isn't hippy dippy shit. <laughs> and at the end of my little, you know, speech where I've got to the meaning of life, he just turned to me and went, well, I'm afraid that really was hippy dippy shit. Right. Anyway, <laughs> I, I felt like punching the fucking idiot. <laughs> um, that one actually started off really badly because when we did our little briefing before we went on stage, he's like, right, Chris, so you're an addict, right? Immediately, if you if you use stigmatizing labels on, on me or anyone, I you you've yeah. set off on the wrong wrong right. So you've got a battle with it every day. You can't and I'm like, dude, no, no, not at all. I'm I'm like literally like a, I don't go to any meetings. I'm- <laughs> Who was it that walked out on um Good Morning Britain? I think she walked out when she saw the term and I, I totally agree with what she did. 
they um they showed the addict it came up on the it was a celebrity and they called her by the name and then it's got former addict mm -hmm. and she walked off she said I'm, i took out her ear piece and said that's it i'm not because you've got me down as a former addict and i and i do understand completely where you know yeah it's a disgusting yeah. way to label a fellow yeah. you know uh, I always just say someone problematic out, you know, yeah, problem yeah. with alcohol or da, da. And when this guy called me that, I was like, dude, you can call me skydiver, pilot, yeah. world traveler, former Royal Marines commando, best selling author, top, top folks, podcast host. <laughs> Although I, I do realize I've talked a lot in this one because <laughs> I've just, <laughs> uh, it's been such a great chat. Um, you know, you, 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 moreover, you can call me a very proud father and, and, and happy family. But you choose the one thing that was like 20 years ago in my history to, to it's, it's it's come on. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's that thing. It's it's all about enlightenment. And when you're, you know, unless you're exceptionally nice, loving person, you you go with a narrative, don't you? And that's that's the, the narrative that comes out of the TV. Never, never looks at addiction as like actually it could be really positive when when you yeah. look back at it and it makes you who you are and um it's funny you should say that because i i don't regret any of the bad moments in my life because that is what made has made me what i am today and learn from it and also has made me kind of understanding in any of the job roles that i did in the past um because of that experience so yeah you're right yeah Rich, one final question. What's your lovely dog called? Because I've got it up on the screen now. Yeah, that's Florence. Uh, she's known as Florence, full name, Flo. We call her Flo. And um, she's four years old and she's, uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's my little baby there. She, uh, she was a little bit unwell the other night, so we were quite worried. And then we realized it was indigestion. <laughs> so dogs do get indigestion. <laughs> Yes, and there's a lesson to be learned there, isn't it? You can be really horrible to your dog because you're having a bad day. Not not suggesting you yeah. do, folks, but I've 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 seen someone kick the dog because they mm. they put their meal down on the table in front of the telly, went out to grab a knife and fork, and in that in that moment, the dog wolfed it. <laughs> right, wolfed it. That. <laughs> you, you can get really cross with your dog, and what do they do? They just come back and love you, don't they? Yeah, um, unconditionally. Yeah. yeah lesson there for all of us rich i could talk forever mate i've same here thank you for thoroughly thank you for having me thoroughly enjoyed it yes um well you took the words out of my mouth absolutely thoroughly enjoyed this chat and i really hope uh, people at home i'm going to do a technological wizardry here and click this button and and it just said dear friends if you could like and subscribe I really hope you um you've got something from this. Yes, I do realize I've talked a lot, but it's 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 just a, a great medium for getting some good stuff out there for you. You know, all this this knowledge it's hidden from you from birth. My generation, you know, like my parents didn't talk about any of this. They just didn't know it, and yet I want my son to, you know grow up being able to make sense of the world. I want him to look at a leaf blowing across and go, oh, there goes grand granddad, you know? Um, so yes. So uh, please let us know in the comments if you've got something out of it, friends. Rich, massive love to you, mate. Um, just Thank just, you. And massive love to you. Back. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Please just stay on the line while I, while I play I it out and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you properly. Also, I need to borrow a tenor if that's possible. Um, uh, I've just lost myself then. <laughs> Friends, big love to you as well. If you could like and subscribe, that would be ace. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.